Thank you. I love my uh, left knee a little less than my right. <laughs> That's a bit of a pain. <laughs> um, so self-organizing systems in learning is, is um, what I work with. And I need to just spend a, a few, a, a fraction of a minute explaining uh, that first bit, which is what is a self-organizing system? Because people tend to um, think of it as in its English sense, organization of the self. But it's anything but that. It's actually completely different. A self-organizing system is a, is a system or a, or a thing or, or a creature or whatever which is able to produce order out of disorder. Sometimes we call it spontaneous order. And you can see that uh, actually all over nature and all over society, actually. Um, I once did a study on, uh, uh, on a subject which you cannot study in England, which is what happens to a traffic junction if the traffic lights fail. You can very easily study this in India. <laughs> <laughs> I studied it in India for a while and, uh, um, uh, and was able to, do, uh, to, to uh, show that over a period of time, after the initial chaotic bit is over, the vehicles move as though there is an invisible system of traffic lights turning on and off. And we worked the math out for that, and it was a self-organizing system. Um, I bumped into this kind of accidentally many years ago uh, in, a, in a completely different context. I was doing an experiment, which later the press called the hole in the wall, um, the experiment was very simple. What would happen to children, to poor children, if I gave them a computer with an internet connection? This experiment was done in 1999, so uh, don't think of it in today's terms. So these would be children who would, have, who would not know what a computer is, would have not heard of the internet. They, would, uh, they don't know any English. And I got an astonishing result. Um, far surpassing uh, anything that I had expected. What I'd expected was that I would, you know, very proudly show that the children can take a few first steps towards understanding the computer. What I didn't realize, and what I hope to tell you the story of, is that they, what they showed me in that little experiment was a result that would change primary education in the whole world. So what happened next was that um, I saw the ch children take the first steps. They started fiddling with the computer. They you know, uh, were doing the kind of things you might expect. They learned that a cursor will change into a hand, and if you click on that, then something happens. A couple of days later, I found that somebody had downloaded a game and had installed it. That wasn't really supposed to happen. <laughs> and people said, oh, this is you know, nonsense. Uh, 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 you're sitting in Delhi and uh, in a corporate part of town which is full of programmers and all sorts of things. Somebody showed them. So I repeated the experiment about uh, 300 miles away from Delhi and uh, in a village where the chances of a passing software professional would be very, <laughs> very low. <laughs> I uh, went back after a couple of months and found children playing all sorts of games and so on, uh, exactly as they had done in Delhi, uh, except that this time around, when they saw me, they said, uh, we need a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> so I then said, how do you know all this stuff? And they complained. They said, you've given us a machine that works only in English, so in order to use it, we've had to teach ourselves English. Now, that was also not supposed to happen that way. <laughs> so I started, that's how I got into education, which is not my field, actually. My field is physics. Um, and I started to continue experimenting. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them. I won't go over, the, over all of them. But I was able to show in a period of about five or six years' time that uh, groups of children left unsupervised with the internet. All the words are important. Groups of children unsupervised 
in a safe and public place with the internet can learn how to use it, learn how to search, improve their math, improve their English, improve their pronunciation, so on and so forth. Um, I kept pressing the limits and found, believe it or not, 12-year-old Tamil-speaking children in an Indian village can teach themselves the first-year undergraduate material on how the DNA molecule reproduces in biotechnology in two months by themselves. Okay? So, um, I continued the experiments. I did some measurements in Uruguay. And finally, one day, while I was doing all this out of Newcastle University, uh, a school teacher from Gateshead came to my room. Her name was Emma. And she said, what about us? So I said, what do you mean, what about you? I mean, you've got rich schools, developed economy. You don't have any problems at all. Um, I mean, my work has to do with really poor children and so on. Well, Emma took me to County Durham. She drove me all through Durham, all through Northumberland. And uh, she showed me the schools in our remotest areas. And uh, I, had, I had no idea. I had never seen that England before. And I said, my God, this, it's full of problems. It's different kinds of problems. It's, it's not problems entirely of money, but it's problems to do with other things. You've got problems to do with obsolescence, problems to do with uh, jobs going away, problems to do with alcoholism, and so on and so forth. Um, I started to work with Emma. So Emma said, let's do the hole in the wall in England. I said, you must be out of your mind. If you do the hole in the wall in England, all you'll get are frozen children. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've got ridiculous weather here. <laughs> so, so, so then came this flurry of activity with my colleagues saying, you know, maybe we can put in these halogen heating lamps like they have outside pubs. And I said, no, no, we won't do that. What we did finally was, we turned the hole in the wall inside out. It's quite easy to do. You take a room, remove all the furniture and everything, put in about, let's say put in five computers with big screens, okay? I'll tell you in a moment why big screens. Big screens. You let in about 20 children, and you ask them a question. I call these questions big questions. They have to be interesting, big questions can be as, as difficult. The answers can be as difficult as you want. The answers can be unknown. It doesn't matter. Uh, the harder, the better. And then you tell them, I'm going to give you some time, usually about 30 minutes or so. You've got to tell me what's the answer. And what you get inside the room, then, is the hole in the wall. And these children, to them, English is not a foreign language. They flew. You know, I saw them fly in Gateshead. So, I've been a teacher for almost all my life, so it uh, you know, makes me really sad to write that. <laughs> well, the data shows me that that's what's happening. There is a generation growing up that's capable of learning anything by themselves under the right circumstances, and if you do not constantly tell them that that can't be true. More about it in a moment. Um, uh, in the middle of all these experiments, I found out another thing, that if you, when the children are doing this researching and running about and making a noise and so on and so forth, if you go up to them, if a, if a non-threatening figure, preferably not knowledgeable, but friendly, goes up to them and says, wow, that's fantastic, how did you do that? The process seems to amplify. I called it the grandmother's method. Uh, and I wrote an article in the, uh, the Guardian saying, if you are a British grandmother, if you have uh, internet and a web camera, can you give me one hour of your time for free? And uh, I got hundreds. There are about 600 of them now. You know, I know, I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. <laughs> <laughs> They're called the granny cloud. And you can use Skype to beam them in to where teachers cannot go. With the instruction, don't teach, just admire. 
So a presence of a friendly mediator can improve self-organized learning. I was beginning to suspect at this time that what we were seeing is spontaneous order. That in a semi-chaotic, if you can set up a semi-chaotic educational uh, environment, you will get spontaneous order. And like most other spontaneous order, you can't predict what it will be. You can't decide where it will go, but it will go somewhere. We called it a self-organized learning environment. It's very simple. It's got broadband, it's got collaboration, and it's got uh, admiration as the three components. You get the idea. It's basically very noisy, and you get to do all the things you're not allowed to otherwise do, which is run around, talk to each other, look at each other's work, discuss. Uh, there is no adult help available. There's, if there is a teacher, she's away somewhere. Otherwise, you won't get that spontaneous order. But there's a problem. This method, the soul, spread across England. It spread across Europe, North America, South America, and, and then it went viral. Tens of thousands of schools, all of them reporting the same thing. But there was a problem. All the teachers said, two years before the end of school, we have to stop all this nonsense because there is an examination. And in that examination, none of this will happen. You have to do other things. So I looked at the assessment system and discovered something interesting. This is, uh, you know, this is a picture of an office from about 1890 or something like that. Um, no telephones, no internet, no machines at all. These people had to do the work that machines do today. And they were required in millions. The whole world had to run with these people. Here is the Indian education uh, examination system today in 2015. Do you get the idea of what's happening there? <laughs> We're preparing an entire generation for employers who are dead. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. <laughs> what, what are we teaching them? Be silent, learn to read, run to write, to do arithmetic in your head. Uh, read and understand instructions and follow them. Do not ask questions and under no circumstances should you be creative. I mean, you don't want a creative clerk or a creative assembly line worker. You know, you can imagine what that will do to your end product. <laughs> you don't want a creative robot. But then, this is the world for which we have to prepare our children. It looks more like the hole in the wall than it looks like that other office from the 1890s. So should not the examination system look like that? That's what I'm working on right now. Uh, no, no one is agreeing with this. <laughs> this is what I have to say. Allow the internet into the examination hall and it'll change the entire system. The guy who writes the questions has to write differently. The teacher will teach differently. The parent who says, don't keep staring at your phone, will say, no, 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 pay attention to the internet. You'll learn how to search properly and so on. I examined what the examination system is like, actually, and I have a couple of examples which are very interesting. Um, this is it, you know, uh, which term is often used to describe the USA of 1920s, the roaring 20s, the raving 20s. I mean, is, there, is it, uh, what will happen to your life if you don't know that? <laughs> <laughs> which, is the, uh, which of the following is a carboxylic acid? You know, the gobbledygook, gobbledygook, and gobbledygook. <laughs> if you don't know that, that's it, you're finished. <laughs> you know, you know who, who in the whole of the animal kingdom is interested in carboxylic acid? Snakes. They get killed by it. They would like to know this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best. Singapore school final examination. Julie is asked to identify the contents of her stomach. 
And if she cannot do it rightly, her whole life will be different. <laughs> well, in 2013, I got this prize. I'm setting up these seven labs across uh, five in India. I have set them up, five in India, two in England. And over a one and a half uh, year, uh, over a three year period, we'll see what happens. I, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'll tell you what that film was about. It's about five places in India going from the remotest parts of India uh, through to urban middle class India and into urban middle class Britain. The idea is to find out, can we do a self-organized learning environment remotely? This is what they look like. This is in Killingworth. They're quite simple. They look like basically cyber cafes for children. That's Newton Aycliffe. It's a little private school in Maharashtra, a village in Bengal, and my remotest in the Sundarbans Delta, uh, where the Ganges meets the sea. There's nothing there, no electricity, no healthcare, no schools, nothing at all. So you know, when the, the main mode of transportation on this planet used to be horse and carriage for about the last 5,000 years, until the automobile got invented, and the horses went. But something else happened, which we didn't expect. The drivers, the coachmen, they went away because the passengers became the drivers. Passengers like you and me. And you know, we're creative people. We did all sorts of things to driving. We invented drunken driving, driving on the wrong side of the road, running over each other. So traffic lights, constables, licensing authorities, everything was changed, but the coachman never came back. The passengers drove. In many ways, I think of this, this experiment as, a, as an experiment to let, um, let the passengers drive. So results say that they will go somewhere. I, I have another one and a half years to find out where. But in the meanwhile, here they are, the passengers in charge. And we'll find out where they go. Thank you.